Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'd like to welcome you to this two-day mini-review. My name uh, is Professor Lakin, L-A-K-I-N, and I begin by uh, give, giving you my home telephone number, because I know in the days ahead, as you prepare for your final preparation, it may become necessary for you to reach out and possibly run a question by me or ask me to explain something. And I'm always there for you because I want to make certain that each and every one of you passes the New York bar exam. My home telephone number is area code 914. That's in Westchester County. Area code 914. You may call me at any reasonable time of the day or evening, 24-7. But if you're lucky, you will catch my grandson one day. Henry is 10 years old, and he has been studying law with me since the age of four. So he's fully familiar with criminal law, if no other subject. Because we have been discussing robbery, arson, kidnapping, murder, manslaughter, and particularly felony murder. So Henry always asks me to remind the audience that he is ready to help you. Ask him for the definition of burglary and he will spit it out. So uh, if you're lucky, you'll catch Henry because when he visits with us and the phone rings, he typically yells out, Grandpa, I'll get it, it's one of our students. So hopefully you'll hear his sweet voice. Now I begin by telling you, you do not have to be a genius to pass the New York bar exam. Statistically, first time takers who pass the New York bar exam, that group is anywhere typically between 84% and 87 or 88%. This is of first time takers. So the overwhelming majority of the candidates who sit for the New York bar exam for the first time will pass, and that includes you. But there are certain things that you need to do and want to do when you write your essays and you answer the multiple choice questions, whether they be the New York or the MBE, or you do the MPT. There are certain things you want to do that will earn you extra credit when you write it. And that's what we're going to focus on. We begin our review with the subject of contracts. And you may wish to make some notes or perhaps refer to the written material that you've accumulated in the past, but we want to refine and uh, obviously explain how you are likely to be tested and what the graders are looking for. So when we talk about contracts, we are talking about the common law rules of contract law that govern four types of contracts that you will be tested on in the bar exam, and you may wish to note. One is a real estate contract. Number two is an employment contract. Number three, a service contract. And number four, a contract to build. It will usually be to build a house or to build a commercial building. When you are given one of those four, you will be basically being tested on your knowledge of the common law rules of contract law. However, when it is a sale of goods contract, you will be tested on your knowledge of Article 2 of the Uniform Commercial Code. I intend to cover the highlights of both areas, common law rules and Article 2 rules. But we start with the common law rules, and I need to inform you that there are three topics within contracts or sales that represent 50% or more of the exam content. What are those three tested topics? One is offer and acceptance, two is the statute of frauds, and three is consideration. 50% or more of the essay questions or multiple choice questions or MBE questions will test your knowledge in those three areas, and that's where we want to focus our review. So what you need to understand is the common law rules, and we will cover them. We will give you the New York distinctions, which they love to test. And uh, when we have completed it, you will be much better prepared than your typical average candidate who has a good sense of the material, but does not have all of the detail that uh, will enrich your essay and earn you a higher grade. So we start with formation of a contract. Formation of a contract. Questions often appear whether or not a contract has been formed. And here you're being tested on your knowledge of the various rules that deal with 
offer and acceptance. Understand that there are certain material terms that a party, two parties, must agree upon. So will you make the note that in real estate contracts, there are five material terms that the seller and buyer must agree upon. Number one, the identity of the parties. From the correspondence that you are reviewing in the fact pattern, you will have to determine whether or not the seller and buyer have been identified. Number two, a reasonable description of the real property. It does not have to be perfect. You do not need meets and bounds. A street address is sufficient. And even if there is no street address, many a bar exam question has tested whether or not there is a contract when the seller agrees to sell his house in Brooklyn, New York. So I'll sell you my house in Brooklyn, New York. That is a reasonable description of the real property and that's what you are expected to state. A third requirement in a real estate contract is the sales price. The fourth one is the amount of the deposit, if any. And finally, number five, the closing date. All five material terms must be agreed upon between seller and buyer to have a contract. If you are missing the closing date, there is no contract. If the parties have not agreed yet upon the amount of the deposit, there is no contract. And so you need to lay out in a discussion of formation of a contract for the sale of real property, these are the five material terms. So when a seller makes an offer, he can make an offer to uh, sell real property orally, and that has been asked. It is only the contract for the sale of real property that must satisfy the statute of frauds. So an offer may be oral or written, and it must contain the five material terms. And if an offer is made, obviously it may recite that it has an expiration date. But if there is no expiration date of the offer, you know when it expires at the end of a reasonable time. And if you are discussing what is a reasonable time, you may wish to note, there are three factors the court will consider in determining what is a reasonable time within which the offeree must accept the offer. One is price fluctuation. Now, real property does not fluctuate every day in price, whereas tomatoes or cotton or candy or oil may obviously vary from price, price will vary from day to day, especially a commodity. So price fluctuation helps the court decide whether or not the offer has expired within a certain period of time, because we know if no time is stated, every offer will expire at the end of a reasonable time. A second factor the courts will consider is perishability of the subject matter. Obviously, real property does not perish, but tomatoes and uh, vegetables perish quickly, so it's a shorter time. What is a reasonable time when you are dealing with perishable subject matter? And the third and final factor the courts will consider in determining whether or not a reasonable time has expired is what are the known, K-N-O-W-N, the known needs of the offeror. You see, the seller might say to the buyer, I hereby offer to sell you Black Acre, and he lays out the five material terms, and he says, I'm anxious for, uh, for an answer. I'm leaving for Europe uh, in the next week. That would imply that the offer, by its terms, will expire in a much shorter period of time because the seller has made known his needs to the buyer, offeree. So what is a reasonable time you have something to write about? Obviously, if the offer states that it will expire at 5 p.m. on Friday, then that is the expiration date. <clears throat> so, another major rule tested, you should note. Under the common law rules of contract law, an offeror may revoke his offer at any time prior to acceptance. I repeat, an offeror may revoke his offer at any time prior to acceptance. Now there is an exception called the option contracts, which we will get to shortly. You need to know what a counteroffer is, because oftentimes the writer will include a series of correspondence between seller and buyer, or employer and employee, in which there is counteroffer. So what are you going to say about a counteroffer? Here's how you write it. A counteroffer is a rejection of the offer.
and a new offer made by the offeree. So the offeree now becomes the offeror when he makes a counteroffer. I repeat, the offeree becomes the offeror when he makes a counteroffer. And here you should make a note, an important note, that an inquiry is not a counteroffer. An inquiry is not a counteroffer. So here's how they test this. Seller offers to sell Black Acre to the buyer for $1 million. All of the material terms are stated in the offer. The offeree responds as follows. You're asking prices too high. Will you take $900,000? Is that a counteroffer or is it an inquiry? Answer, it's an inquiry. There is no language of rejection when the offeree buyer said, you're asking prices too high. Will you take $900,000? Watch for it. It's a little bit of a trick question. But the writer is testing your ability to determine whether this is a counteroffer or only a mere inquiry. A mere inquiry is not a counteroffer. Therefore, the offer is still on the table. So what does the buyer do? He says, you're asking prices too high. Will you take $900,000? You know what happens next? You will be told the seller does not answer his letter. Now what does the buyer do? He writes a second letter. Dear Mr. Seller, you are a hard man to deal with. I accept your offer on your original terms. Question, is there a contract? Answer, yes. Why? Because the first communication by the buyer was a mere inquiry, not a counteroffer. Therefore, the offer is still alive on the table, if you will, and the offeree may reject it. I'm sorry, the offeree may accept that offer if he timely does so. And so that's how they test it on the bar exam. So we need to talk about revocation. An offeror, we learned a moment ago, may revoke his offer at any time prior to acceptance. They will ask you, if the offer is made by letter, can the offeror revoke by telegram? Yes, any method of communication is effective to revoke an offer. It does not have to be the same means that the offeror used to make his offer. But when is that revocation effective? Upon dispatch by the offeror or upon receipt by the offeree? Answer, upon receipt by the offeree. So note that the revocation is effective upon receipt, not dispatch. That has been tested. And make a note that the revocation is effective upon receipt even though not read by the offeree. Even though not read by the offeree. How do they test that one? The offeror revokes his offer on Monday by letter. The letter is received by the offeree on Tuesday morning at 9 a.m. But the offeree does not read the letter of revocation until 5 p.m. And usually in that question, at noontime, the offeree, without having read the letter of revocation, sends off a letter of acceptance. Question, is there a contract? The revocation is effective upon receipt even though not read, and that's how they test it. And that's what you want to remember. <coughs> so we're down to the topic of when is acceptance effective. The headline is when acceptance is effective. Here we have two rules that you are being tested on. And a lot of people have difficulty with the mailbox rule. They don't, do not articulate the rule as carefully as it should be. So be careful how you write it. And the topic is when is acceptance effective to form a contract? And we have rule number one, where the offeree uses the same means of communication, underscore same means of communication used by the offeror the offeree's acceptance is effective upon dispatch. You may use the word dispatch, it means sending it. Because sometimes it'll be two telegrams, telegram of, uh, containing the offer and the telegram containing the acceptance. So it's effective upon dispatch when the offeree uses the same means. That's rule number one. That is what is commonly known as the mailbox rule, but people mix it up. They don't understand that in order to invoke the mailbox rule, the offeror and the offeree must use the same means of communication. Letter for letter, telegram for telegram, fax for fax, email for email. That's what we're talking about. So that brings us to rule number two, which is the one they like to test. So asterisk number two, 
where the offeree uses a different means of communication, underscore different. I repeat, where the offeree uses a different means of communication. The acceptance is effective only upon receipt, timely receipt, insert timely receipt by the offeror. Timely receipt. So you have to read the question carefully. The offer may be made by letter. This is how, this is how it's tested. Offer is made by letter from a California seller who wants to sell Blackacre in New York to a commercial buyer. So California seller makes an offer by letter. The New York buyer accepts by telegram. You will be told the telegram is lost, never received by the seller in California. Now what? Is there a contract? No. The analysis goes like this. Here the offeree used a different means of communication. And therefore his acceptance will not become effective until it is timely received. Since it was lost, it was never timely received, therefore there is no contract. And that's how they test it. Notice that if, they, if the offeror and the offeree use the same means of communication, which is usually a letter on the bar exam, the letter must be properly stamped and correctly addressed. That has been tested in MBE questions. I repeat, where the offeree uses the same method of communication, example letter, the letter must be properly stamped and correctly addressed. And so they've had questions in MBE land where it was mailed to the wrong address. Well, if it's not properly addressed, it will not become effective upon dispatch even if the offeree used the same means of communication because he did not correctly address the envelope. And so it will not become effective until it is timely received by the offeror. And that has been tested. So we're done with when is acceptance effective to form a contract? These are very, very important tested rules. And if you were to ask me what is the single most important topic in contract law that is heavily tested, the single most important in terms of the point value is offer and acceptance. And now you are obviously better prepared to answer the questions they will ask you on that topic. Mirror image rule we should mention quickly. Mirror image rule. What does it mean? It means the offeror, uh, the offeree, the offeree must unconditionally, the key word is unconditionally, accept all of the material terms of the offer. And when the offeree unconditionally accepts all of the material terms of the offer, there is a contract. However, if the offeree puts in conditions, or you, when you look at the language of the offeree's acceptance and it does not constitute a mirror image of the offer, there is no contract. We need a meeting of the minds, and that's what mirror image is all about. There must be a meeting of the minds, which means both parties must agree on all of the material terms, unconditionally. No ifs and buts. Next topic is termination of an offer. Watch for this one. It goes like this. The offeror makes an offer on Monday in writing to the offeree. All of the material terms are set forth in the offer. And the offer by its terms states it will expire on Friday at 5 p.m. You will be told on Wednesday the offeror drops dead of a heart attack. Dies on Wednesday. You will be told on Thursday the offeree, without knowledge that the offeror died on Wednesday, the offeree on Thursday accepts. Question, is there a contract? Answer.